Hello and welcome back. So today I want to talk about diodes and well semiconductor junctions in general and that is because I want to talk about the varicap type of diode. Now normally if you have an LC circuit so in an oscillator or a receiver or something and you want to vary the resonance frequency you can either change the capacity of the capacitor using something like a variable capacitor or you can try to change the inductance of the inductor using something like a variometer or some other form of variable inductor. But the problem is that these two components, even if you build them a bit better, are quite large. So these are physically large components and because of their mechanical nature, they have a limited lifespan. If only there was a way to change the inductance or the capacitance using some form of electronic device. Well, when it comes to the capacitance, one of the components that you can use is the varicap diode. So if you're curious about how this thing works, what are its use cases and what are its limitations, then keep watching. So let's start off by remembering how a capacitor is built. Now in its most basic form, a capacitor is built from two conductive plates that have a certain surface area and which are separated by a certain distance. And then in between the plates, you need an electrical isolator called a dielectric. And the capacity of the capacitor is therefore determined by its physical properties, so surface area and distance, and by the dielectric constant of the electrical isolator. So for example, with the classical variable capacitor, dielectric is air, that doesn't change. The distance in between the plates is fixed, but what you can change is the area of contact in between the plates. So by varying the capacitor, you reduce the area and therefore reduce the capacity. Now, to build a capacitor, you can use any isolator you want as a dielectric, and you can use any conductive material as the plates, even semiconductor materials. And this brings us to the semiconductor diode. So this is a device built from a block of semiconductor, usually silicon, that has a region doped with positive charge carriers, so the P region, and with negative charge carriers, the N region. Now, by themselves, the P and the N doped semiconductor are conductive. So you have a charge carrier, so it can be conductive. But put together like this, they become conductive only under specific conditions. So right in the junction between the two areas, the holes from the P region and the electrons from the N region recombine, canceling each other out. So you're left with a so-called depletion area where you don't have any charge carriers. So this area in the middle is electrically isolating. To get the diode to conduct, you need to apply a positive potential to the P region, negative potential to the N region, and the voltage of at least around 0.6 volts so that the two charge carriers are pushed together and they can recombine again and will get the diode to conduct. So new charge carriers will be formed and then they will recombine and the current will be passing through the diode. Now on the other hand, if you apply a negative potential to the diode, the charge carriers are pushed aside and your depletion area increases. And so we have the basic building blocks for a capacitor. We have our two conductive plates. So by themselves, the two regions are conductive. We have an electrically isolating material in between them, our depletion area. And by applying a negative potential to this device, we can vary the width of our depletion area. So we can make our capacitor variable by applying a negative potential to it. And this is basically how the varicap diode works. But it's important to mention at this point that this property isn't something that happens only with the varicap diode, it, it happens with any diode. It's just that the varicap diode is specifically built and fine-tuned for this exact purpose. Now, if we look into the datasheet of such a component, so what I have here is the datasheet for the BB640 varicap diode, we will see that the capacity is specified for various reverse voltages, 
So this diode goes from around 69 picofarads down to 3 picofarads. The more negative the voltage applied, the smaller the capacitance, because the further away our conductive regions are. But we can also find a dedicated graph where we have every single voltage and every single capacity inserted. So we can see exactly just how linear the variation of the capacity is with the applied voltage. And of course we get all sorts of other data regarding how well two diodes can be matched, so what are their tolerances. Now if we look at a different kind of diode, so what I have here is the MBRS360 Schottky power rectifier. So this is definitely not intended to be used as a varicap diode, and we scroll through the graphs, we get to this thing. So what is the typical capacitance when a reverse voltage is applied? So we get our variable capacitance effect even with the Schottky diode. And this being quite a large current diode, it has a large junction, a large semiconductor block, we have large capacity. So we can see that at 0 volts we have almost 400 picofarads, and then this goes down to about 50 picofarads at its maximum reverse voltage. So even though in this case you would not want to have this capacity, you still have it. And we see the exact same behavior of capacity dropping with stronger reverse voltage being applied. So now let's see how we can take advantage of this property of the diodes by measuring it. Now initially I wanted to measure the capacitance variation using the capacitance meter, but that didn't work out. So the next best thing was to create an LC circuit and try to measure its resonance frequency. And for that I got this setup here where I'm using my analog discovery to measure this resonance frequency variation. Now I have two setups prepared. First one looks something like this. So I have my supply, which is my benchtop supply right here. Through an 100 kilo ohm resistor I'm supplying my varicap diodes. So I put two of them just to increase the capacity to make it easier to measure. This first capacitor is here just to filter out any noise coming from the supply. It doesn't really have any other use. Then my diodes are in series with a large value capacitor. So this is just a DC blocking capacitor to isolate the DC part of the signal. And then I have a 1 millihenry inductor, which together with my varicups is forming an LC circuit. And these are then connected to my analog discovery circuit to measure the impedance. So this is what it looks like. So right now we have zero DC bias voltage, the varicups are at their highest capacity value, and we see that we have a resonance frequency of around 350 kilohertz. So now if I turn to my supply and start to increase the DC bias voltage, we can see that our peak is starting to move to the right. So slowly it's moving based on the applied DC voltage. So at the maximum voltage that my supply can supply, 26 volts, we went from the initial 350 kilohertz up to around 735 kilohertz. And now if I remove the bias again, so we go down to zero, we will see the exact same phenomenon but the other way. So we can see how the resonance frequency is now decreasing. Now the second setup that I prepared involves using Schottky diodes as varicups. So here we have the same setup as before with a few differences, namely that rather than using an isolation capacitor, I used a second diode. So this is an arrangement that is quite commonly used, in which two diodes are placed in opposing directions, but they're both connected to ground, one of them directly and the other through the inductor. So both of them are seeing the same DC bias voltage, but none of them is directly polarized. So if we now turn to this setup, same thing as before, measuring using the analog discovery and then applying a DC bias, we see that our initial frequency is again around 300 and something kilohertz, so 332 in this case, and if we start to apply a DC bias, we will see that again our resonance frequency starts to move up, because the equivalent capacity of the diodes is decreasing. So with these diodes, we go up to about 580 kilohertz. So it's not as 
a large difference as before, but that depends on the diodes and the exact setup. Now we can recreate the exact same experiments also in the circuit simulator in LTSPICE. So what I got here is the first setup that we tried out. I'm using a varicap diode that is already built into the LTSPICE library. I'm applying a DC bias on one side 0 and on the other 10 volts. And then this is connected through the isolation capacitor to my one millihenry inductor. And then I'm measuring its impedance by injecting a current. So if we run this simulation, we can see we have a certain resonance frequency when we have zero DC bias. And by applying the 10 volts, we have a much higher frequency resonance because our capacitance has dropped. So by default, the diode models in LTSPICE and in the SPICE language in general already have this capacity variation with the applied DC bias. So it's implemented with the proper Varkab diodes, but it's also implemented with normal types of diodes. So what I have here is a circuit with the Schottky diode, and I also created a similar circuit with the 1N4148 diode. So if we look at how these behave, so first the one with the Schottky, by applying the DC bias, we see a change in resonance frequency. So we also have some sort of problem with the quality factor of the circuit, but that doesn't really matter. And on the other side, if we look at the one with the 1N4148, again, we see our variation. So any diode will exhibit this property. It's just that the proper Varicap diode has this property enhanced in the sense that it's far more predictable. Two diodes with the same order code will behave as close as possible one to the other, and the behavior is made to be as linear as possible. So with normal types of diodes, the behavior will exist, but it's not so predictable. And of course, you can find Varicap diodes in all sorts of values. So you can find them from a few picofarads up to hundreds of picofarads. So you can use them in all sorts of circuits. Now, speaking of use cases, on the one side, you can build tuned LC circuits like this. So to use them as filters, maybe in some sort of reception equipment, you can use them in oscillators. So for example, in frequency modulation, you can vary the frequency of your oscillator by small amounts using a DC signal or, well, low frequency AC, your audio. But the capacity of the diode will stay fixed as long as the applied high frequency AC signal is small. What I'm trying to say is that the diode doesn't care if the applied signal is DC or AC, it, it will still vary its capacity. So when you have large AC signals going over the diode, those will also have an impact on the capacity of your diode, not just the slow DC signal. Now, to minimize this capacitance variation effect, the circuit that you will need to use will be the double Varicap diode circuit, also called the balanced circuit. So here I set up this sort of circuit without adding the inductor. And here I'm inserting my DC potential through a 100 kilo ohm resistor. And then my second diode is pulled to ground through an extra 100 kilo ohm resistor. And then I'm inserting an AC signal through an isolation capacitor. So if we run this thing, so first of all, we have quite a large AC signal being applied, a high frequency signal. So it's a six volt peak to peak signal. But now if we look at what happens on each of the diodes, so with blue, we have the lower diode and with red, we have the voltage drop on the upper diode, we can see that the AC voltage that's being applied is not applied equally. So depending on how the polarity of the input signal is occurring, one of the diodes will see more of the voltage than the other. So as the capacity of one diode increases, the capacity of the other one decreases. So even though this is not a perfect setup, the total equivalent capacity of the two diodes in series will stay roughly constant. So when you need to keep your total capacity constant, regardless of the high frequency signal being applied, you will need to use this double diode circuit. Now, on the other hand, with a single diode, if you apply a large AC signal, you will get your capacity variation effect, which will distort the signal. And this is quite a useful feature in frequency multiplication applications. So just to highlight the effect, what I have here is a sine wave that has quite large amplitude, so 30 volts peak to peak. And then through a free picofarad capacitor, 
I'm connecting this to a varicap diode, so a single varicap in this case. So if we run this thing, we see our initial signal, so this is running at 10 megahertz. And if we look at what is on the diode, so we see that it's quite a small signal, that's because of the way the capacitor divider is working. But if we now just focus on this signal, and we zoom in a bit, we see that it's not very sine wavy. I mean, it looks like a sine wave, but we can see that the upper edge is a bit more pointy and the lower edge is a bit more rounded. Now, we can get a better idea of what's going on if we look at its spectrum. So we can see our input signal is quite clean, so as clean as the simulator will allow it. We have roughly 90 decibels between our initial peak and its first harmonic, but after applying the signal to the body cup diode, we see that the difference between our initial peak and the first harmonic is only about 20 decibels. So by taking advantage of the capacity variation of the body cup diode, we can use it as a nonlinear element to create distortion. And what makes the body cup special when it's used for this purpose is that the diode doesn't really conduct current. So at all times it's being used as a capacitor, so a reactive element. So in other words, you're not supposed to have any sort of losses. And the main use case for this is therefore not to simply create frequency multiples that can be further amplified, but rather using this sort of frequency multiplication at high powers to generate high power, high frequency signals. So when you can't really build an oscillator anymore because you're running at very, very high frequencies, you can use the body cup to multiply your base signal to much, much higher values. So all in all, the diode's capacity variation with the applied reverse voltage is a general phenomenon. It will happen with any diode. It's just that with the special varicap or varactor type diodes, this effect is enhanced. But it's something that needs to be taken into account regardless of the circuit for which you're using your diode. So all in all, hope you got some useful information out of this. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to be updated with all my videos and see you next time. Bye bye.